Hey guys, welcome back to Yarnum. It's your friend Waki here, and we are coming towards the end of our journey. In the last episode, we beat the wet nurse, so we've only got a couple of the main bosses to go. But before we get to that, I'm going to do a couple of the optional areas. Uh, the first up is the uh, Upper Cathedral Ward, where we find our friends in the, the Healing Church. And uh, to be honest, this is probably the area in the game that really freaked me out the most. The weird, eerie music combined with the darkness in the area really, really creeped me out. So I didn't enjoy playing this at all. It's also a really tough area, filled with a lot of tough enemies, so this is going to be quite difficult, especially on a one bro level. Uh, but get into it. There's, um... So obviously we all know that this is basically where the choir hangs out. This is where they do most of their experiments. So a lot of weird and creepy shit hap happened here. Now I think it's also important to talk about how this area reveals the true nature of the healing church. You know, I talked about it in the Vicar Amelia video before, but essentially the church is all about power. It is, the motives have always been Machiavellian in nature. I don't know if they were still idealistic when uh, Lawrence broke away from uh, Willem, but, you know, but I'm sure pretty soon they got really, really, you know, <laughs> completely self-absorbed and they were only interested in their own power and there's a lot of evidence for that here I mean aside from everything that you know that we've already seen uh, first of all you're going to find some a really interesting item here you know about four and a half minutes into this playthrough in this video you will pick up the uh, cosmic eye watcher badge and that's the first item we want here uh, when we actually pick it up we can actually buy uh, beast blood pellets from the insight shop now that's really interesting, because if you read the description of the beast blood pellets, they read Large medicinal pellets, supposedly formed of coagulated beast blood, banned by the healing church due to their unclear origin, grants a spur of beasthood. Now we know what these pellets do, they basically, you know, uh, increase your beast, beast stat, which in turn makes your attacks stronger and your defense weaker. But the line is banned by the Healing Church. That's really odd considering the fact that once you get the um, Cosmic Eye Watcher badge, you can buy these items, which straight away, in my opinion, shows that there was a direct connection between the church and these uh, items. They use them on a regular basis. And of course, like any other power hungry organization, what they wanted to do was prevent anyone else from using them. That was their whole idea. That's why they were banned. It's not because of their unclear origin. That was just a cover story. Um, of, uh, and what's really interesting about this, in my opinion, is that the church has always been against uh, beasts. You know, uh, to them, beasthood is what happens to the weak. If you remember Vicar Emilia's dialogue, before you know she actually uh, <laughs> turns into a beast herself she talks about the weakness of man and how the beasts lower men and you know um, draw them into the depths basically they think that uh, and this is actually i think quite true in the world of bloodborne that you know when you uh, go into beasthood you're descending into a lower form of evolution you know you're more you're more bestial based nature but of course that's not what the healing church was aiming for they wanted to ascend they wanted to go into higher planes of existence and be able to commune and maybe even become great ones themselves so it's rather ironic that this church was using a weapon that increased their beasthood in order to you know increase their own power and we also know that the church fought against beasts and enemies much greater than ordinary you know wolf beasts now, more evidence regarding the nature of the church you can actually see in the description of the white and black church garments. The black church garment reads that most healing church hunters are elementary doctors who understand the importance of early prevention of the scourge, achieved by disposing of victims and even potential victims before signs of sickness manifest themselves. So rather than helping the people of Yanam recover from the scourge of the beast, which by the way they got after they took the healing church's uh, special blood, uh, they'd rather dispose of the people who were affected by it because it's not in their interest to help anyone. It was just, you know, something to, uh, it was just a giant experiment for the church. They weren't interested in helping anyone. And if you look at the description of the white church garment, it reads that they believe that medicine is not a means of treatment, but rather a method of research. So that just shows that for them, this whole thing was a one large experiment. The people of Yanam were their guinea pigs and they were using them to find ways to ascend. Now one really strange fact when you um, come to the upper cathedral ward is that there's two main types of enemies here. 
uh, you've got the brain suckers and you've got the beasts. Now, what's interesting, like I said before, is that these are two diametrically opposed types of enemies because the brain suckers are associated with insight and with ascension, while the lichen type beasts are, for the average human being, the deepest manifestation of the beasthood. So, why are they both here? Now, uh, it makes sense for the brain suckers to be here. You know, to me, it's quite obvious that these were members of the healing church that went mad. In fact, uh, later on, when we pick up the um, orphanage key, we actually get it, get it after killing one of the brain suckers. And obviously, since the uh, orphanage is run by the choir, it's, it makes sense that uh, a member of the choir, or at least a member of the healing church, turned into this brain sucker. And of course, the healing church are obsessed with insight. You know, they were basically interested in ascension and understanding the universe. So it's clear to me that basically, one way or the other, these brain suckers are the result of an experiment gone wrong. I might even go as far as to say that perhaps they've actually been taken over by the phantasms. Because what explodes from the brain of a... Uh, a brain sucker when it tries to suck the uh, insight out of the player character it what looks like a giant phantasm that lives in its uh, lives in your brain and if you go back and look at the um, image of the uh, madman's knowledge item again that's a skull of a human being which is deformed because it's got you know very large incisors uh, sorry uh, very large canine teeth but at the top of the brain there is an image of what is clearly a phantasm popping out of its skull. So, you know, to me, that is more than a coincidence. It quite shows that the nature of the phantasms has something, you know, they could potentially, you know, take over your mind if, you know, if perhaps if you take too much insight. I'm not sure how it would work, but somehow it seems clear to me that in the case of the brain suckers, they've been dominated by the phantasms, are basically zombies that are being controlled by them at this point. And so why are there beasts here? So that's the most interesting part, you know. It makes sense for the brain suckers to be here, but the um, beasts don't make any sense because, like we said, the um, healing church hated the beasts. Here's what I think happened. And it's important to note that the beasts here have blue eyes. They don't have um, red eyes like some of the other beasts. They have blue eyes. And there's two pieces of evidence that I think are important for my argument. First of all, the brain suckers. Obviously, there was something went wrong in the healing church itself and the brain sucker started taking over uh, and so what would the rest of the remaining human members of the healing church uh, do obviously they're going to start using beast blood pellets which i talked about before and i think they use those uh, to obviously strengthen themselves because it's a very important and powerful weapon in the game in order to fight the brain suckers and of course this in itself got out of control so the more the um war within the orphanage uh, uh, raged, the more beast blood pellets the remaining human members of the um, healing church were forced to consume and that took them closer to beasthood and eventually they lost control of themselves and became beasts and you know obviously the like type beast we see here and so I think that's a good explanation about why you see both types of enemies in the game or at least in this area I should say. So once we picked up the orphanage key from one of the brain suckers and made contact, uh, we can actually proceed up towards the orphanage level of this um, area. Now of course we're going to move now into the lumen flower gardens. This for me is definitely one of the most important areas in the game because it shows how the um, healing church was doing two things. One generating the blood itself. I think the blood is actually generated in the lumen flower gardens. It makes a lot of sense in my mind that they were growing it. And two, it shows how they were able to um, create celestials. Now, obviously the orphanage itself is, you know, allusion to the fact that it's quite clear that the healing church were either kidnapping or basically taking orphans from the city of Yarnum, bringing them here and using them as the base of their experiments to actually create Celestials, and of course, as we all know, the aim of the um, healing church was to make contact. And the celestial em emissary boss, who we're just about to fight, that guy is basically their biggest success. You know, I think he or she, whoever that person was, is probably their finest achievement in regards to being able to try and make contact. I said it before in the earlier video that 
you can actually hear the celestials communicating. It's as if they're communicating across water using sound waves. But I won't go in, uh, too deeply into that right now. There's an, actually another video I want to make for it. But, you know, regarding the celestials, you can actually literally see them coming out of the ground. They, you know, in the boss fight itself, they actually pop up from the ground itself as they come and attack you, which is really interesting. And I think it's a great metaphor about how they were created. So regarding the boss fight itself, it's certainly not the um, toughest boss fight in the game. It's actually, I think, one of the easiest. For the purposes of this playthrough, I definitely recommend you use the Hunter Axe and definitely use the R heavy R2 spinning attack because it's going to make your life a lot easier. Because for now, what you can definitely do is uh, by um, Beast Blood Pellets and you might as well make use of them, you know, especially in a fight like this. We, combined with the spinning R2 attack on the Axe, they do a hell of a lot of damage to the Celestial Emissary and they actually raise your beast to start really quickly. You can see it just pop up each time you perform the act, act uh, sorry, perform the spinning attack and uh, connect with your enemy. It makes it a lot easier and basically, you know, drives up your uh, your attack uh, stats. Uh, so I definitely recommend you do that. But like I said, it's not a very difficult fight. So I don't envision, you know, anyone really having too much problems with it. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. Uh, as usual, thanks for watching. Uh, we're coming towards the end now, so there's only, I think, a handful of videos left, but look forward to them. They're coming up pretty soon. Uh, in the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe as usual, and I will see you next time. Cheers. Bye.